today's reading is James 4, verse 13 to 17 in the Chris, of the Christian Standard Bible. Um, I just printed it out. This is not the full Bible. Um, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are like vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So it is sin to know the good and yet not do it. Fam, this is week 10 of our Real Talk series. It's been a significant series and a significant 10 weeks in the life of our church. Thank you for all the feedback. We've heard a lot from you about the service, about the series, the conversations about these themes and about these topics in all of our different groups and spaces, uh, like our city groups as an example, have been great. They've been convicting. They've been encouraging. And they've been real. Yeah, I see what I did there. Our conviction, this is now Lissacho and I, uh, was that this series was the right thing at the right time. And we were convinced that these were the things that we had to press into. Were you hungry? Over the last 10 weeks, there's the question, to learn what the Bible says about these topics. Let's reflect on our last week. Fam, this is not an interrogation, it's a corporate reflection. Okay, so we're going to think back on our last week. Question of the day just loosened the muscles a little bit, right? And it warmed us up for some reflection. How was your sleep this week? How productive were you this week? How much time did you spend on social media? this week? How much time did you spend reading your Bible? And don't tell me always, because you can't. You're lying to yourself. How much time did you spend reading your Bible? How much time did you spend in prayer? And once again, don't tell me I always pray. You can't speak for 24 hours a day, even if the person is in the flesh next to you. How much time did you spend in prayer? How much time did you spend in Christian community this week? How much time did you spend serving others this week? How much time did you waste this week? How many times did you wish you had more time? How many times did you run late this week? And don't tell me never, because two-thirds of you were late this morning. <laughs> I hope that that is a Conviction laugh that you guys have there. How many times did you miss your goals or your meetings for the day this week? Real talk. All of us were given the same amount of time this past week. All of us. God willing, all of us will be given the same amount of time next week. You can't tell me you don't have time, because you do. Real talk. Disciples of Jesus steward their time faithfully. As every second is a gift given to us by God. Do you hear me this morning? We should be humble before the Lord's sovereignty, right? He knows everything and He's in control of everything. And being humble before His sovereignty means stewarding our time faithfully. Real talk. Stewarding our time well is a real challenge. 
for a long list of reasons. Think about all the yes but thoughts and excuses that just popped up in your mind as we went through the reflection. How much time did you spend in prayer this week? Not a lot, but. How much time did you spend reading your Bible? Not, not a lot, but. Just think of all of all those buts. Those are all long lists of reasons why we struggle to steward our time faithfully. The Bible talks about how we steward our time, and we need help in this. So let's pray, and then we'll jump in. Lord Jesus, every second is a gift from you. It's your breath in our lungs this morning. Pietra said during worship, this is the day that you have made. It is not a right we have. It is a miracle that you raised all of us from our sleep this morning. We do not want to be flippant about our time. We do not want to waste it. We want to use it for your glory. And Lord Jesus, now as we work through this teaching text with all of our excuses and all of the ways in which we struggle to face reality about our stewardship, I pray that you would soften our hearts. I pray that you would drop our defenses. I pray that you would breathe a living word into us this morning. I pray that you would transform us. I pray that you would make us faithful. Give us wisdom as it comes to us this morning through the scriptures, we pray. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our teaching text is from the book of James. James is the half-brother of Jesus. That means he knew Jesus. And many of the things that James writes in his epistle, or his letter, echo the words of his half-brother. And also, it echoes the scriptures that they were raised on. James writes wisdom literature. Wisdom literature wants to teach us, listen, how to live your life God's way. That's what wisdom literature is all about. Sounds like something all of us need now, doesn't it? Now, quick one. If you are not a follower of Jesus, I'm really glad that you're here. And I want you to know that you can do with your time whatever you want because you're the Lord of your own life. Fair enough. You live your, li you live your life your way. If you are a follower of Jesus, though, you absolutely cannot do with your time whatever you want because you are not the Lord of your own life. Jesus is. You live life His way because all of your life is submitted and surrendered to Him. Fam, we didn't just give our hearts to Jesus. We gave our lives to Jesus. We just sung that this morning. In view of God's great mercy, all of us, this is our worship. It's a convicting reminder for me this morning, and I hope for you too. All of life, fam, not only certain parts of it, is to be lived humbly under the Lordship of Jesus. That is a Christian worldview. Now, the central theme of this passage that we read this morning is arrogance. Arrogance through, two big English words, I don't know how to make it simpler, so I'll explain. Arrogance through presumptuous planning or egotistical planning. Do you know what that means? You are arrogant if you say, I can do with my time whatever I want. That's what James says. And James also says that you are arrogant if you say, I am in control of my time. So whenever you conduct yourself this way, James says to us this morning, pump the brakes, fam. That's arrogance. And that is not the way that you live your life God's way. Now in the bigger context of the book of James, James is specifically addressing what we can call the cocky hotshot businessman. That thinks that he's in control. Okay, so I had to take a portion of scripture that's uh, um, set in a larger context. So James is going for this person specifically. For today, though, for us, James will be addressing all of us. And what James does is he gives Christian instruction in hopes of changing our behavior. Okay? He rebukes the church. 
like a parent does a child. So brace yourself. This is a tough word. Every now and then, I run a marathon that has an unbelievably steep hill right at the end of a marathon. Fam, that is oh, hardcore. Omidam this year, on kilometer 48 of 50, we hit a 1.7 kilometer hill. Unbelievable. Do you know what you do when you get that, to that hill? You keep going. You keep going. You keep going. It is brutal. But you keep going. So this last sermon of this series is like that uphill towards the end of our sermon series. Let's do it. Question. Why should we steward our time faithfully? There you go. Read it with me. Firstly, because you don't know the future. Secondly, your life is a viper. I just want to check if it's on there. Yeah. Thanks, Rudolf. Chap. Why should we steward our time faithfully? Because the Lord is in control. Because arrogant planning is evil. And this is a rapper. You sin if you don't. You don't know the future. Let's start. I'm going to show it verse by verse. Look at my highlights. James starts and he says, Come now. Is James being sarcastic? Yeah. Is he being serious? Yeah. He's being seriously sarcastic. Look what he says. Come on. In South Africa we say, let's be honest. Do you know when you say that to someone? It's when both of you know the answer. And here's what James says. Come on now. You don't know. Do you see the highlights? That's where he starts. Now, important. The Bible never condemns working hard. Hear it from me. It never condemns making plans. It never condemns being industrious. It never condemns having an entrepreneurial spirit. It, it doesn't condemn those things. It actually commends those things as good stuff. What the Bible condemns is sloth. Proverbs values hard work and diligence and investment Proverbs condemns what, he, uh, what the book calls the sluggard, the sloth, the person who is characterized by laziness and inactivity and idleness and apathy and, this is a big one, procrastination. That's probably a pandemic that we should be wearing masks for, I think, in our culture this day. Now nah, I'll get to it at some point. You won't. Stop lying to yourself. Do it now. None of these attitudes or actions glorify God. And that's why the Bible condemns it. Now check this. So the Bible commends some stuff. The Bible condemns some stuff. Do you guys know what the Bible doesn't commend? The Bible doesn't commend making money. Any character in the Bible who said, look, I'm loaded. Do you know what the Bible's reaction is? There you go. Not impressed. It's not something that the Bible commends and says, spend your life on this. Make more. Never. The Bible condemns what it calls the love of money. And it says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So what's the problem with this businessman in James chapter 4? It's not planning. It's a good thing. It's not work. It's a good thing. It's not money. It's also a good thing. What's the problem here? The problem is arrogance. That's the problem. This person is making plans without dependence on God. As if he or she knows. And James just said... Come on now. You do not know. Look at verse 14. Now we do know something about the future. Right? Let's start there. 
but we only know what God has chosen to reveal to us through the Bible. That gives us great hope, right? Can I remind you, fam, that we are in the time of the church and the Spirit, and the only thing that lies ahead for us is the big restoration, the big redemption, all things new, and being put back into the nature that it was created for in the beginning. And us receiving new bodies, spiritual bodies, living with God forever in His presence, Him with us, us with Him, heaven and earth in one. I can't wait to go. If Jesus, come back now, if Jesus comes back now, I'll go, yes, cool, let's go home. So we know all of that. But where we'll be, and what we'll do, etc., until that day, well, fam, that's in God's hands. And that should humble us. If, if I asked you five years ago, can you tell me where you'll be on the 15th of October, 2023? Who on earth would have been able to predict that accurately? <laughs> None of us. Because you simply do not know. We need to plan with a real dependence on God, asking Him to set our agenda. Do you do that? Because that's what you should do. And the Apostle Paul would amen that. Look at what he says in Ephesians 5. Follow it with me. Verses 16 to 17. Look at my highlights. Pay careful attention. Making the most of the time. And he floats the W word in there. Don't be unwise, be wise. And we just read a portion of scripture that comes from wisdom literature. So planning with real dependence on God, asking Him to set our agenda, Paul would go, absolutely, amen. Do you know how we do this? It's simple. We start with, Father God, what's next? What should I do? That's how we are supposed to plan. And then be dependent on how God speaks back to us. Because then, fam, in obedience to Him, we won't leave stuff unsaid and undone. That's our biggest problem. There's always guilt about all that was left unsaid and undone. But if you plan with real dependence on God and you act in obedience, you won't leave stuff unsaid and undone. Your life will be focusing on the things that actually matter. And that's a sobering reminder. When you think of your last week, like what did you put first in your life? Let me show you a quote from a guy called Kerry Egan. He is a chaplain, uh, a hospice chaplain. Do you know what they do? They sit with people who die. That's what they do. Like that's their job. It's their calling. Look what Kerry Egan, he's a Christian, look what he says when someone asks him, what do people talk about? He says mostly they talk about their families. Let's double click. About their mothers and fathers, their sons and daughters. They talk about the love they felt and the love they gave. Often they talk about love they did not receive or the love they did not know how to offer. The love they withheld or maybe never felt for the ones they should have loved unconditionally. They talk about how they learned what love is. And what it is not. That stuff that actually matters. How much of that is reflected in your calendar of this last week? How high were these things on your agenda? Can you show me where in your calendar these things happened? Because if you can, that means that you intentionally chose to spend time on these things. If you can't, it means that you did not intentionally choose to spend time on this. And remember, no one has more or less, we all get the same. So you can't be rich in time and poor in time. 
You just have time. That's why I asked a series of questions with the words, how much time did you spend? Because it's a resource that's given to us. Fam, don't be lulled to sleep or distracted by everything this world promises. Do you know what this is? In the accent of George W. Bush, it's not a weapon of mass destruction, it's a weapon of mass distraction. That's the problem with our phones. It keeps you distracted, slouched over, tight shoulders. Vrr, vrr, vrr. My phone doesn't make that sound. I'm just putting an F there. Some of you all roll old school, index finger. Fast asleep. Fast asleep. Distracted. Not focused at all on the things that are of first importance. Why? Because you'll believe that there'll be more time. That's the lie. That's the lie that the enemy catches you with. When in fact, you have no clue what's happening tomorrow. Do you see the warning, fam? And once again, I'm just delivering the message. I didn't make this up. But James says, if you think that there will be more time, you have got no idea what you're saying. Because none of you know what tomorrow will bring. How do you get up in the morning? Are you aware of the miracle and the privilege of another day? Do you see God's gift and God's grace of a new day? Because fam, if you just roll out of bed and you kick into parent mode, or you kick into work mode, you are never going to start your day receiving the gift of God's grace. Asking in dependence of Him what, it is that it, what is it that He wants of you and acting in obedience. You are going to wing it. How do you go to bed? Do you take time to thank God for His grace and His provision that He gave to you throughout the day? Because you start each day with God saying, my grace for you is new this morning, and my grace for you is sufficient for today. So fam, if you reach the end of your day, then you say, God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your moments of wisdom. Thank you for the moments of your kingdom. Thank you for my moments of surrender. Thank you for all the gifts that you've given us. You cannot go to bed like this. And expect to understand God's goodness or grace, fam. It doesn't work like that. You are wasting your time. And you've got no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. No idea. Will you pay careful attention and make the most of your time? Second reason, your life is a vapor. Let's look at verse 14. Uh, it kind of says it like it is now, doesn't it? You are like vapor. Appears for a little while. Gone. You vanish. Like this. Think of some smoke or steam. Travels, travels, gone. It was just here. One wave. Whew, I was at a reunion yesterday where the oaks vaped like machines. So I walked around like this yesterday. But the point is, you blow that steam, and you go, and it's gone. I don't actually know if that's the past tense of vape. Vaped. But anyhow. Consider the fact that your heart could stop beating at any moment. It's humbling, isn't it? We just said every day is a gift of God. We just said it. He sustains us as we sleep. Fam, it doesn't matter who you are or what you think of yourself. Do you know that all of us take up the same needy, humble, dependent position at night? That is the fetus position. Think about it. 
It's a great illustration of how small we really are. Because it doesn't matter who you are, how rich you are, how cool you are, or how many followers you have, all of us eventually end up like this every single day in total dependence. Total dependence. Total dependence on God to wake up the next morning. Don't lie in the fetus position with your phone. Because you're going to forget how dependent you are on God. Don't do it. You're asleep. Wake up. Did James come up with this idea? That we vapor? No. He's drawing from age old. Timeless truth in the Bible. James did at least three psalms a day. Right? Growing up as a Hebrew. Look at what Psalm 103 and Psalm 90 says. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. Psalm 90, teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Because your life is here today and gone tomorrow. How are you feeling? At this moment, you should be overwhelmed. Let me give you some grace. Let me give you some good news. Fam, 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 listen, listen. Do you know who isn't a vapor? Jesus Christ. Come on now. He gets described in the Bible as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is, was, and will be, the one who doesn't just disappear with a swipe of hand. In light of what we just said, that is great news. Think about it. If we don't know what the future holds, because we don't, and our lives are so brief that it could vanish any second. It's a vapor. It's easy to believe. Well, what is the point of it all now, isn't it? Now, here's the good news. The point of it all is that we were meant to live forever. And we were meant to live forever in God's presence. And we were meant to live forever in God's presence in perfect harmony with Him. And in Jesus, the one who is not a vapor, but the one who is everlasting, we live forever forever. Jesus was crucified. Jesus was dead at the age of 33. Dead, dead. Three days in the grave. But he didn't stay dead. That's great news. His death satisfied the wrath of God, right? It paid the price for all of our sins. And then his resurrection defeated death. And therefore, we will live forever in him. Our bodies can't last forever, so we get a new one, and then we live on. That is the gospel. That is the truth. It can be trusted. You can put your full weight on it. You can put your whole life into it. It will hold you. We are gospel-centered church, which means that the birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus Christ is what we focus on. We proclaim this every week through song and preaching so that everyone who hears can have the opportunity to believe this. Take the opportunity. Why? Because your life could be over like a vapor. And you won't get another chance, fam. Listen to me. That's what James says this morning. Be sure of this. Do not doubt your faith in Jesus Christ. Don't leave it to chance. Your life is a vapor. Admit your sin. Believe in Jesus. Confess Him as your Lord and Savior. Now. Because your life is over. Like this. Why should we steward our time faithfully? You don't know the future. Your life is a vapor. Let's look at this one. The Lord is in control. Verse 15. Instead, says James, not unwise, but wise. Instead, here's what you say. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Now, many people in the time of James would say stuff like, if God wills. Many people in the time that James lived would say stuff like, um, if the gods will, right? Some people believed in uh, a polytheistic 
uh, view of God, meaning many gods. James says, no, 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 listen, listen, listen. The one who calls the shots, the one who is in charge, the one who is Lord, who we know and who lives in us, if he wills. Do you see that? If you say, if the Lord wills, it's not like you don't know who you are talking about. Do you see that? You're talking about Jesus Christ, the one who lives inside of you. Now, look at this verse. What does the Lord will? The Lord wills the duration of our lives, and the Lord also wills the direction of our lives. Strap in. Bible. Here we go. Psalm 139, verse 16. Look at it. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. That's the duration of our lives. It's in God's hands. How will I know? Only He knows. Look at the direction of our lives. This is the Apostle Paul again bringing your boy Paul into the conversation. In Acts, 20, in Acts 18 verse 20, when they asked him to stay for a little longer, this is Paul now, he declined. But he said farewell and added, check this, I'll come back to you again if God wills. Beautiful, eh? In the Bible. There you go. And then he set sail from Ephesus. Just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, we must always say, not my will, but your will be done. That's wisdom. That is how you live your life God's way. That's how you do it. Look at what the book of Proverbs says. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Proverbs 19. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Beautiful, huh? Now what's important here is we are not called to Passive fatalism. Do you know what passive fatalism is? That's saying the following. Whatever be, will be. Whatever will be, will be. Fam, if you live that way, you don't serve a sovereign God. Because a sovereign God controls everything. And knows everything. That kind of fatalism isn't a Christian posture. Christianity is far from being passive. How do we know that? Well, because James has given us plenty of commands to actually do. Can you see that? James doesn't say, sit back and then say, I'm going to let go and let God. James has 48 commands in 108 verses in his book. The whole book is about action. And in verse 17 that we'll get to now, he says, you have to take action if you know what the right thing is to do. So it's not about let go and let God. It's about let go and do what God says. That's the, me the message of James. So don't wait passively because you don't know what's going to happen in the future. God has given us a whole book of instruction. This verse is simply reminding us of who is in charge and how that puts all of our planning in perspective. It should actually give us great comfort. Why? Because we make plans, we go to work, we work hard, and then we remember that God is working out His own agenda in our lives. And that agenda, fam, is good. God's agenda for our lives is transforming Him into the image of His Son. So make your plans, but then acknowledge in your heart that your plans are subject to change. Because God is in control. We plan with this mindset, I need the grace of God and I am dependent on the will of God in every part of my life. The Lord is in control. Let's keep going. Number four. Arrogant planning is evil. Look at the highlights. Boast. What do you boast about? Your own arrogance. What's wrong with that? It's evil. Here's the root of the problem, James says. You boast and you brag. I found a rapper of a quote this week. Listen. None are so empty as those who are full of themselves. Mm. 
None are so empty as those who are full of themselves. It's arrogant to not believe and confess that your life is in the hands of God. That's what Paul says. Uh, that's what James says. James doesn't have an issue with working or planning. He has an issue with arrogant independence. Hey, let me ask you a question. How do you react? This is an important question. How do you react when something out of your control changes your plans? The Uber is late. How do you react to that? The weather changes. The weather is wild. It stifles your plans. Oh, the N1 is all piled up. You sit in a taxi, and the driver tells you, we're only going to leave when it's full. How's that? We lose our minds, fam. Let's be honest. Hey, wait, wait. Let me talk like James. Come now. You lose your mind. Why? Because I am the center of all my plans and time. Check this. And I had it all planned. And because I had it all planned, it should happen that way. Do you see? There's the arrogance. So the arrogance isn't in I had it all planned. The arrogance is in because I had it all planned, it has to happen this way. Do you realize that God can lift his proverbial finger and all your plans are changed? Because he's God and you're not. A Christian worldview is a humble worldview. It acknowledges the sovereignty and self-sufficiency of God. God doesn't need you, you need him. God knows everything you don't. God is everywhere, you're not. God is in control of everything, you are not. You know what? In South African English... God's deal is bigger than your deal. God's deal is bigger than my deal. And that's why we don't plan in this arrogant way. Last one. Why should we steward our time faithfully? Because you sin if you don't. Now I mean, once again, nice one James. Look at the highlights in verse 17. It's sin to know and not do it. It's sin to know and not do it. Now, did this feel random to you, this verse? Because in, in the structure of James, if you read it in Greek, it kind of feels like this little proverb comes out of nowhere. So when I studied it, I saw that most commentators believe that this was actually a common saying or a common proverb that people knew in the context of James. So James, as he's writing this letter, goes, Ooh, let me drop this bad boy right in here. This is the good place to drop it. James says, you have no excuse when you know what to do, but fail to live out your faith. It's sin. Did you hear that I said you have no excuse? I'm not saying you have good excuses. You have no excuses. According to James. He lobs this one at us. And now we have to sit with it. And ultimately, the decision that we have to make is, are we going to obey this? Because remember fam, all of this, 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, is breathed by God. Not some parts of it, all of it. So, James 4 verse 17 qualifies as all of it. And now the question is, are we going to do it or not? James, James gives us a really good perspective on sin. Stay with me, I'm almost done. James talks about sins of commission, doing what God says not to do. Right? Do not commit adultery. So if you do it, it's a sin of commission. This is how we usually think of sin, right? With all the doubts. What James is talking about here is called sins of omission. 
not doing what God said to do. And this would involve what James has just said. This morning, I was bent over our basin in the bathroom, brushing my teeth on my way to go for a run. I was planning to listen to a podcast, the second series in the money series of Rooted Fellowship. I already started thinking about it. And as I stood there with my toothbrush, I felt God say to me this morning through His Holy Spirit, you're not going to listen to a podcast. You are going to pray for my people. And I went, okay, cool. Do you know what I did next? You take the headphone out of your ear. Obey right away. If I didn't do it this morning, I would have been in sin. My earphones were in already because I listened to the Bible while I brushed my teeth. Hashtag Bible nerd. I had to go, boom, boom. You unravel me like it all caught out of my shirt. It's a Bethel joke, guys. And I had to put down my phone and my headphones immediately. James says, admit your dependence on God when you make your plans. If you fail to do so, you are in sin. Why should we steward our time faithfully? Because you don't know the future. Your life is a vapor. The Lord is in control. Arrogant planning is evil. And you sin if you don't. There's a long list of reasons why we struggle to steward our time. Fam, you and I should be humble before the Lord's sovereignty, and we should steward our time faithfully. Amen. Fam, I'm going to give an opportunity for us to respond. Okay? Now listen to me so that you can follow my instruction. Response means, I am convicted of something today. I'll walk through five things now. And I'm going to respond to this conviction and take the necessary next step and do something about this. Once I've walked through all five, then I'm going to say, if you want to respond today, please stand. And when I ask you to stand, I'm going to pray over you. Standing is not a shame. This is the place in which God is supposed to work in us. So if I sit and someone else stands, do you know what I say? Praise God, because something happened here. If I feel the conviction and I stand, I don't say to myself, oh, I wonder who's looking at me and thinking I'm a failure. <laughs> I stand and say, praise God, something here happened. So I want to pray for you. Five responses. You don't know the future. Fam. Some of us are very anxious about the future. Very. To such a point that you are sick. One of the ways in which to respond to this word today is to admit and surrender your anxiety. And do you know how you do that? You say to God, I do not know the future. But I'm so anxious about the future because I want to be in control of the future. I'm this, giving this to you now, the author of our future. That's one. That might be you. Second one, your life is a vapor. Fam, the day you die, you can't be unsure if you're a Christian or not. Be sure. So, today might be a commitment day for you. Today might be the day in which you say, I want to be sure. I am going to admit my sin. I'm going to believe that Jesus paid for my sin. And I'm going to confess Him as my Lord and Savior, which means that everything will change about everything about everything. Some of y'all might need to recommit. Fam, we continuously have to recommit in our relationship with Jesus. So maybe today your response to the second point is, I've been going about flippantly with my life. And I want to recommit. Jesus, you are Lord of all. And that means all. Third one, the Lord is in control. Maybe your response today is to obey and move. Obey and move. 
Not knowing what will happen in the future, but you don't know anyway. James just said that. And who's got the future in his hands? God has got the future in his hands. So maybe today that's your response. God, I'm going to take the first step in obedience, right? All of my life are yours. I'm humbly planning. I'm asking you what to do. You say that I must do something. I'm going to go for it. I don't know the end game, but I'm going to do this. Fourth one. Well, fourth and fifth actually go together. If your planning is arrogant, repent. That's your only response. Do you know what repent means? It means turning. Not headed in that direction anymore, but headed in a new direction over here. Do you know what the Hebrew word for repent means? It means coming home. Come on now. Come home. Come back to the Father. Do not live as if you're not His child. And the last one counts for this one too. If you know what to do, but you don't do it, then you are in sin. So repent and obey right away. I would love to pray over you. Who wants to respond this morning? Let me pray over you as you stand. Lord Jesus, your spirit transforms us. It matures us, it grows us, it bears fruit in our lives. Your Spirit leads us, and above all, your Spirit gives us wisdom. Your Spirit helps us to understand how to live your way. And Father God, through your Spirit, you brought this conviction on us this morning. You spoke to us, and whatever it is that we're responding to you now, or whatever it is um, that our response entails. I want to pray for myself and for all my brothers and sisters standing. Liberate us from our anxiety, Lord Jesus. It's wearing us down, it's tiring us out, and it's making us sick. We surrender it all to you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you that we can be sure of our faith. Thank you that we can recommit ourselves to you again. I pray that if that is us this morning, Lord Jesus, that we would feel lavished by your grace and that we would sing and respond to that grace that you've given us. Liberate us from whatever it is that we are stuck in. Give us the freedom that comes with being your child. Lord Jesus, all of us need to obey continuously the whole time because you are Lord of our lives and we are not. So we repent this morning. We repent of all our wasted time. We repent from never letting you into our plans. We repent from all the times that we know exactly what to do and then we do exactly the opposite. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that, our, that we can be reconciled to you without paying for these things. We pray that all in your name, Lord Jesus. As we sing now that we surrender ourselves to you, I pray by your Holy Spirit that we would stay surrendered for the rest of today and if it's your will then we live tomorrow, for tomorrow and the day after and the day after. We love you Lord Jesus, we surrender ourselves to you. Amen.